All right, let's go. Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we will have the text up on the screens behind me in just a little bit. Uh, we also have some physical Bibles scattered around the room, little racks beneath the seats. If you don't own a physical Bible of your own, we would love for you to take that one home. Uh, we believe that God uses His Word for all kinds of important things, and I'd love to uh, tell you more about those things, but <laughs> uh, i gotta, I got to move quick this morning. <laughs> so, so, we have made it now to week five of a, a series through a letter that honestly takes less than five minutes to read, uh, if you're a pretty good reader. Um, that, that means that God has been really good to us, right? It means that God has allowed us to kind of dig into to some things and flesh out some things. And, and so uh, let's kind of walk through real quick like what we remember. Like uh, we've seen Jonah's call, right? Uh, God comes to Jonah and says, get up. I want you to go to, to Nineveh. I've seen their sins, their wickedness has come up before me. And so we've seen Jonah's call. And then we've also seen jo- Jonah's futile attempt to run away, right? How'd that go? You laugh. Maybe you're, you've got a story like that. And so Jonah had a moron moment and thought that he could flee from the presence of the Lord uh, by simply skipping town, as if God's not also down in Joppa and also not on the boat. And so the answer is that he, his attempt is completely futile. It didn't work at all. And so the God of the universe wasn't slowed down by him hopping a boat to Tarshish. It, it, it wasn't even... It wasn't a struggle for God. He, he, it wasn't a where's Waldo moment. Where'd that Jonah get off to? No, God knew exactly where Jonah was. And so promptly after Jonah's attempt to run away, um, we also see that God pursues Jonah, right? He pursues him specifically through a storm. He hurls a windstorm upon the waters. And we're told that this storm is a ridiculous one, that, that hardened, fast sailors, the ones who spend all their time on the water, think that they're about to die, and they start hurling all the cargo overboard. All right, so this is a big deal storm, and it's all to get Jonah to turn and repent, which Jonah, we're told, does not do, right? He continues in his stubbornness, but in the midst of Jonah's stubbornness, the, the sailors from Tarshish, probably, pagan sailors who don't know God, hanging around Jonah in this moment, we're told that they get saved. That, I know that's a churchy way of putting it, but they come to the conclusion that the God Jonah is running away from really is the true God, and they should probably go ahead and stop worshiping their false gods and worship the true God instead. They repent of their sin, they make a sacrifice, they make vows, and now the formerly pagan sailors know the true God. What a story, man. Jonah's, this is ultimately a story about Jonah, and so we fly past the pagan sailors and and we learn that Jonah's tossed in the water. He's sinking to the bottom of the sea. And where's God in all this? Already there, right? We're told, we looked at chapter 2 last week, God rescues Jonah right on the brink of, of drowning at the bottom of the ocean. Seaweed wrapped about his head, right? And so, uh, like, like, God rescues him. How does God rescue him? Nothing big. God just appointed a giant fish to swallow Jonah whole and hang on to him for a few days. I actually did the, last, the same thing last weekend, right? Instagram the whole thing. Hashtag salt life. No, see, last week we got, we got to zero our focus in on Jonah's prayer of thanksgiving while inside the belly of the fish. And, and man, what an incredible prayer it was, right? Jonah had lots of really, really great things to, to say and celebrate about God's faithfulness and about his power and about his, about his uh, love for Jonah to rescue Jonah, even though Jonah didn't deserve to, to be rescued. He gave God the proper credit for rescuing him from certain, certain death. And he even took a moment to castigate the rest of Israel for chasing after imaginary foreign gods who were powerless to save them just like God had saved Jonah. Like, how dare you worship something that can't actually save you? What are you thinking? There are a lot of things to point to and celebrate about Jonah's psalm of thanksgiving. But what we didn't see last week was any trace of repentance. There was a lot of celebration for for being saved from death. There was a lot of celebration for what Jonah trusted God would eventually do in getting him out of the fish, but what we did not see was any I'm sorry or God, I'll do what you asked me to do. Jonah sank about as low as anyone can sink, both literally and 
metaphorically, but we discovered that hitting rock bottom is not enough to produce true repentance. It takes more than a rock bottom moment. Dire circumstances are not enough to change a heart that is set against God. That doesn't mean that God doesn't use those dire circumstances. Sometimes he likes to use those dire circumstances. Dire circumstances are a tool that God often chooses to use in the process of granting true repentance and granting humility to a heart. And so so Jonah's runway is a little bit longer uh, than, than what we often, I think, thankfully, need to experience to finally submit to God. But make no mistake about it, God will get Jonah exactly where God wants Jonah to be. He's not slowed down by Jonah's stubbornness. Jonah is stubborn. That is clear and obvious. But God is not handcuffed by Jonah's stubbornness. And so we ended our time last week, the end of chapter 2, we ended with Jonah being vomited up onto dry ground. Fun little children's Bible story, right? Can you imagine the pictures in the children's Bible on that one? And here's Jonah in the boat. And, And here's Jonah in the belly of the fish. And here's Jonah bleached white and smelling like fish intestines. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> well, nor should he. <laughs> but that's where we're at so far. You ready to dig into the rest of the story? All right, let's do it. Chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. All right, so Jonah is vomited out on dry land. We're not told where on the map that he is, but it's safe to guess that he's probably somewhere in Israel, all right? Israel's on the coast, the far eastern coast of the the Mediterranean. All right, Joppa is just south. It's about central uh, part of Israel's coast. If you want to look at a modern-day map, It's like on the southwestern section of Tel Aviv. So it's about halfway up Israel's map. And so it's about halfway up the Mediterranean coast for them. And so uh, we know that he went down to Joppa to get on the boat. And so he could be either somewhere between Joppa or even if the the fish dropped him off at the extreme north end of of Israel. We know that Jonah's got about a five to 600 mile land route to get to Nineveh now. Either way, Jonah's got to walk in front of him. Now, Now that his holy time out has come to an end, he exits the fish in an incredibly ignoble way. He's humbled, he's been restored, and now it's time for him to be recommissioned. So what does God tell him? Arise. Same thing he told him back in verse 2. Get up, Jonah. What God told him at the beginning, God didn't stutter. God didn't change his mind when Jonah fled. He didn't change his mind when Jonah went to sleep in the bottom of the boat. And he didn't change his mind when Jonah gave up and would rather die than do what God told him to do. And neither did God change his mind when Jonah did everything good but repent during his miraculous rescue from the bottom of the ocean. God didn't change his mind. God determined to give the Ninevites a witness. And he equally determined to use Jonah as that witness. And so despite the fact that God could have gotten the message to the Ninevites a hundred times over by now, because of God's faithfulness, because of his steadfast love towards Jonah and towards the people of Israel, God tells Jonah all over again, get up, go to Nineveh. I've got a job for you. And in light of that, can, can we go ahead and point out something that I think a lot of people in our world seem to struggle to wrap their heads around sometimes? Sometimes the most loving thing that can be said to, uh, to someone who's kind of wallowing in their own mess, sometimes the most loving thing that can be said is get up. Right? Now, to be abundantly clear, that's not always the most loving thing. Sometimes it's an incredibly unloving thing, so don't take this as a license to be a jerk for Jesus. Sometimes it is far, far more Christ-like to bite your tongue and nod your head as they continue to make a mess of their circumstances and continue to prove that they don't actually know what they're doing. But sometimes, sometimes it is the most loving and gracious thing you can do to get down on their level, look them in the eyes, and tell them that it's time to quit running the wrong way. Get up, Jonah. It's time to finally do what you already know you're supposed to be doing. Get up, Jonah. I've got a job to you, for you. 
go to Nineveh. God's faithful love for his disobedient prophet is, yes, very, very stern, but it's also an incredibly gracious invitation to join God in something that God doesn't need Jonah to do. God doesn't need Jonah to pull off what God's wanting to pull off here. We haven't made it this far into Jonah's story because God is dependent upon Jonah to get the job done. God's not throwing everything he can at Jonah in the hope that Jonah just might allow him to preach repentance to an Assyrian city. It is God's abounding compassion towards Jonah that causes God to continue pursuing Jonah. Thank the Lord, man, because God hasn't changed. I've got more stories than I can count of God, sometimes stern, but also considerably persistent pursuit of me. Is it, is it that much of, a, of an assumption to guess that you do too? Is that going out too far on the limb? I need God's faithful compassion as much as Jonah did. So God meets Jonah on the beach. She tells him to get up and go to that great city. And uh, how does Jonah respond this time? Well, look at verse 3. First part of verse 3 says, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Let's stop there. Uh, So if nothing else, man, if nothing else, Jonah understands that trying to flee from the presence of the Lord is a bad idea. Right? Right? We're not told anything about his heart here. We don't know. Uh, we're not told whether there's finally repentance going on in Jonah. All right? But at the very least, Jonah is intimately aware of what will happen if he runs the wrong direction. So even if it's reluctantly, even if he's kicking and screaming the whole time, even if it's reluctantly, we're told that he gets up and he heads towards Nineveh. So what, he, what, is, what does the second half of the verse say? So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord, period. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Okay, so this is where we get to dig into the historical reality of the ancient city of Nineveh. Uh, Like we talked about uh, in week two, I think, of this this series, uh, Nineveh is pretty much the modern-day city of Mosul, Iraq. All right, and so if you look at a map of northern Iraq, find the city of Mosul, Basically, Nineveh. That's where Nineveh is located. And so we're told at the end of chapter 4, we haven't gotten there yet, but we're told at the end of chapter 4 that there are 120,000 people living there at the time and also a bunch of cows. All right? and, so, uh, and so if that's true, and we think that it's true, that would have made Nineveh one of the biggest cities in the world at the time. Right, 120,000 people was a big deal city uh, during that part of history. And so we also know from archaeological excavations of the city that um, the city had a pretty formidable wall around it. And so uh, kind of encircling the whole place. And so it truly was a great city, as it's called both in verses 2 and verses 3. But in verse 3, it's, God calls it an exceedingly great city. So what's that about? Well, the Hebrew word, there's the word Elohim. You may have heard that word before if you've been in church very long. It's a word that the Old Testament often translates as God in, in the generic sense, or God, uh, a God. All right, and so uh, w- whether it's talking about the God of the Bible or the foreign gods of the pagan peoples around the Israelites, that's kind of the generic word that the Bible uses for a God, Elohim. And so the most basic idea of the word is the great one, the, the, the one with prestige and power, right? So when God calls Nineveh an exceedingly great city, it's not to point out their size, it's to point out their influence. It's to point out their value to him. So this is what we learn. Nineveh matters to God. The city of Nineveh matters to God, whether it's the large population, whether it's the burgeoning influence on the world stage. It's not long after this that Nineveh becomes the capital of the Assyrian Empire. They're not there yet, but the city is just kind of blowing up and everybody's noticing Nineveh matters to God. And so whether it's the population or the influence or a mixture of both or none of, the, the, none of them at all, like Nineveh matters to God. And that's something that we need to be incredibly careful to always keep in mind when we think about the, the political realities swirling around in our own world today. Like when we think and, and speak of places, especially the ones that are strongholds of darkness, like we could probably all rattle off a, a few of those off the top of our head, right? 
Places that are clearly identified as strongholds of uh, darkness. Places that are filled with pagan peoples who clearly and sometimes even proudly are far from the Lord. What we need to see is that there's a giant difference between how Jonah sees the Ninevites and apparently how God sees the Ninevites. There's a difference there. Now, now both of them understand Nineveh's wickedness. Both of them get that message. Both of them seem to understand the punishment that is deserved for Nineveh's sin. And both of them even rightly understand how little God's grace is deserved on that wicked pagan people. But while Jonah... While Jonah writes them off as a faceless enemy that should not have God's compassion extended to them, as he writes them off as some kind of dehumanized antagonist that ought to get everything that's coming to him, God instead sees them as a people to bestow his kindness upon. Yes, their wickedness is great. God has noticed. Like That's why Jonah is being sent there but they are also a city filled with real people with real hearts that can relate to God. And most importantly, God would have them know him. So whatever the modern day analog for Nineveh happens to be today, whether we, it's close to home or far away, whether they're kind of sinful and do some stuff differently than us or they're incredibly sinful and then the whole world knows it, whatever the modern day analog for Nineveh might happen to be or we might imagine them to be, we must, must see them as a real people who really need Jesus. Period. I I know, geopolitics is kind of a complicated thing. Yeah, I'm aware. I'm aware. Regardless of how geopolitical realities flesh themselves out, geopolitics can never, ever be any higher than second on our priority list. People who need to know the Lord is number one. And so for the second time now, God sends Jonah to the very last place and to the very last people that Jonah believes deserves God's grace. And that matters. It's not by accident. None of them matters to God. So Jonah finally, and I would argue reluctantly, heads towards the great city. And it is an exceedingly great city, but in verse 3 we're told that it's a three days journey in breadth, three three days journey wide, and a lot of ink has been spilled over that phrase. Uh, If you've ever been responsible for teaching through this, uh, then you know that there are pages and pages and books and books and volumes and volumes upon that verse. So, some point to this claim of a three days journey across the city of Nineveh as proof that Jonah is nothing more than some kind of fantastic story full of a bunch of things that are so obviously counterintuitive that it couldn't possibly be real. For instance, a city that would take three days to walk across. It's a hard thing for some people to swallow. And I think that this is another thing in a long line of instances where people looking for a reason to dismiss the Bible usually end up making a mountain out of a molehill. Um... Even the largest cities in the world right now, New York, London, Tokyo, uh, they are not, at this moment, a three days journey from city limit sign to city limit sign, right? Like, the biggest cities in the world don't have a three day journey across, even today when the population has ballooned like it has. And so, it's highly unlikely that Nineveh was that big in the 8th century BC. Not only that, but we know that archaeologists found the wall. They can measure it. It's not It doesn't take three days to walk from one end of the wall to the other side of the wall. So what's going on here? It doesn't take three days to walk from city limit sign to city limit sign. And so some of y'all are putting the pieces together right now, all right? Right? Like no, in modern parlance, like nobody would ever refer to the city of New York as only existing from city limit sign to city limit sign, right? Like, that's not how we refer to New York. It's kind of the big amalgamation of everything. If you're going go to go to New York, you don't, like, you don't like finally believe that you're there when you cross the city limit sign. Uh, you're, you're getting there way before that. Uh, so sitting in the, this room right now in Nashua, New Hampshire, we are, according to many population analysts, a part of the greater Boston metropolitan area. How many of y'all are excited about that? We might fight you if you say it to our face. 
But census people are going to draw maps the way, you know, however census people think it's right to draw maps. And so it doesn't matter that we're 40 miles away. Boston, unfortunately, is the hub that our world spins around. Right? It just is. Sadly so. Population centers in Jonah's day didn't work any differently. They're smaller, yes, way smaller, but like that's, that's how population centers work. You, and so you had one big city and all the little towns and villages around it unfortunately got sucked into its gravitational pull. And so a lot of scholars point out to the larger region around Nineveh, the greater Nineveh metropolitan area, if you will, and point to that as a pretty clear option for something that would have taken Jonah three days to journey across. In fact, some estimate it to be as much as 90 miles. It's a big area. Others, others uh, offer a different explanation. They argue that, well, you know, it probably could be read. I don't know if it is, but it could be read as, as saying that Jonah needed to travel to a bunch of different places within the city of Nineveh, and it would take him three whole days to travel to all these different places and preach on his little preaching circuit. So what does that tell us? Is it option A or option B? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> option A sounds good. Option B sounds kind of good. What it tells us, though, is that the things that often get labeled as problems and inconsistencies in the Bible are often, uh, usually, I think, just things that people haven't been bothered enough to go look for a clear answer, a, a reputable answer. And so things that have been put forward as good explanations of some things. And so if we would just you know, slow down and think about it for a second and maybe do a little bit of research, there, there might actually be some really good things offered up. A lot of people would have probably had a lot more trust in the historical accuracy of the Bible, right? We just go look. Um, but that's free. Also, we're only through verse 3, so we got to go. All right, verse 4. Verse 4, i got to hurry. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and, call, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So uh, we've just been told that Nineveh's responsibility is somehow adds up to a three-day responsibility, right? And how much effort did he give it? One day. <laughs> One day. He covered about a third of the ground that he was told to cover, whatever it is. And what message are we told that he preached? Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Call for the offering. <laughs> now, it could be, it's possible that Jonah said a lot more that, than that. It's possible that that's just a really, really quick summation of the larger sermon that he preached. But it's also possible that that's all he said. Why is that possible? Well, has Jonah seemed really excited to go preach here? <laughs> Like, based on everything we know about Jonah, it seems possible that he just walked through a third of the city and said, eh, you're all going to die in 40 days. It seems fair to argue that Jonah likely told them, only told Nineveh about the coming destruction and not about the opportunity to repent and be saved from that coming destruction. I mean, Jonah is clearly a half-hearted preacher. He don't want anything to do with this. I mean, he knows he can't run away from God anymore, but I mean, he's still only as obedient as he thinks that he can get away with. As he think, he d he's going to do the bare minimum of what he believes God is calling him to do. And so he's, he's dragging his feet the whole way, and he's going to say what God told him to say, but that's it. That's all I'm, that's all I'm giving you. He still doesn't seem to, to care if Nineveh is destroyed. In fact, he seems to be rooting for it. He seems to be trying to manipulate the circumstances so that that's exactly what happens. He'll fulfill his duty because God is making him, but he will not help God be kind to these people. I'm again it. And this is where our understanding of God's sovereignty over repentance and salvation comes into direct play. We get a little theology lesson moment here. If, if we think that God needs Jonah to successfully proclaim his message in order for the Ninevites to hear it and believe, if we think that Jonah's delivery of that message, uh, deli uh, delivery of that message uh, is, needs to be a certain caliber and a certain quality in order for that message to be effective, then the Ninevites have zero hope of repentance here. None. 
They got dealt a bad hand, right? Wish they had a, a better, more winsome, more loving preacher, but that preacher that they got, he wasn't good enough, so sorry guys, them's the breaks. But if we think, if we think that the power of God's message rests in the message and not in the messenger, rests in the message but not the preacher, if we think that, that, that God uses even the most feeble and disobedient of messengers sometimes to accomplish his purposes, then the Ninevites will hear precisely what God intends for the Ninevites to hear, regardless of the weakness of his messenger. So which is it? Is it A or B? Well, verse 5 tells us. Jonah went out of the city. I'm in the wrong chapter. Verse 5. All right. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. So even with a half-hearted preacher, God is the one who grants repentance. This isn't dependent on Jonah. In fact, it's working in spite of Jonah. God is the one who works in people's hearts to call them to himself. God is the one who convicts people of sin and reconciles himself to a people called by his grace. And repentance is exactly what God gives to the Ninevites. Compare this to everything we don't see from Jonah. Like, what actions do you see here that we don't see from Jonah over the last two and a half chapters? They called for a fast. They, they put on sackcloth. We haven't gotten there yet, but in verse 6, we're going to see that they also sat on ashes. Those are incredibly foreign things to our culture, right? How many of y'all sat on ashes last week? Pull out the, the sackcloth wardrobe because the weather's changing. If you know your Bible well, though, you know that those are exactly the things that God calls Israel to do when they... Repent. Something that's not happening right now back on the home front. There's not a lot of sackcloth in Israel's wardrobe during Jonah's day. To fast is to give up food and water for a period of time, all for the, the purpose of showing that we'd rather have God and God's goodness than anything we could provide for ourselves. We'd rather have God than to satisfy our, our hunger and our thirst. To, to, sackcloth was a, a public distancing from fine clothes and comfort and, and to instead uh, humble ourselves and, and, and do those things. And, and like to sit on ashes is about as lowly as you can get, right? That's not a clean moment. Once you got ashes all over you, there's no getting them off. <laughs> Short of a shower. Just spreads. Upon hearing the message of God's wrath, the Ninevites are humbled and humble themselves before the Lord, both internally and externally. Now, does that mean that we model repentance in the same exact ways that the Ninevites do? I don't think it does. This is a manner common in the ancient Near East. Our culture looks a lot differently than, them, than theirs, but... But the posture that, that seeks to immediately humble ourselves before a holy God and call out for his mercy, yeah, that's required. And that posture flushing itself out as some kind of outward sign, it's probably good too. If it only stays internal, maybe it's not true. And we get some more details on what that repentance looked like in verse 6. It says, The word of the Lord reached the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. So a couple of times now in the story of Jonah, the story is looped back on itself. Have you noticed that? Uh, we saw the same thing uh, moving from chapter 1 to chapter 2. We're told in, at the end of chapter 1 how long Jonah is in the belly of the fish. And then chapter 2 kind of rewinds the tape, rolls back on itself, and tells us what happened while Jonah was in the fish, right? And so it's the same thing happens here. In verse 5, we see that repentance sweeps through the entire land. Uh, everybody in Nineveh, whether it's Nineveh proper or Nineveh, 
conglomerate, whatever you want to go with. The, the repentance sweeps through the entire land. And then starting in verse 6, it, it spells out what that repentance looked like and how it spread. And the message the message reached the king of Nineveh. Um, in that period of history, cities would have had their own kings. So whether you want to call him a town mayor, he carried around kingly authority. But he would have been a vassal of the larger Assyrian Empire, and so the Assyrian emperor would have reigned over him, but Nineveh had its own king. But the message finally gets to him, and it strikes home, it seems. The king repents, and he calls for his people to repent. Hey, let it be known that sometimes the gospel moves forward because the right person got saved. I mean, it's, the, it's just the truth. It's the way the world works. Whether it's the leader of a town or the leader of a business or the leader of a family, their influence over the, what they're responsible for and who they're responsible to lead, their influence leads to affecting change in others. So maybe you're here today and you're a politician or you're a boss or you're a husband and father or maybe you're all three or none of the above. Verse 6 makes it pretty clear that if you own your responsibility to do what's proper before the Lord, those that you're responsible for leading are more likely to own it too. Dad, do something with it. Don't phone in that responsibility. Do something with it. The king of Nineveh use his influence to call everyone else around him to true repentance. And that call was thorough. Uh, he issued a proclamation. It's time to fast. I'm fasting, you're fasting, we're all fasting, we're going to be happy about it. But not just the people, the cows too. I don't know why the cows. <laughs> Cattle and flock, they don't get to eat either. Now, to be clear, the animals don't have anything to repent of, but the point, I think, is to publicly model the contrition that is happening throughout the whole people. It's not just an individual thing. No, everything, everyone is going to show off this repentance before the Lord. And so a lot of people, I think, tend to, to see repentance as only ever a personal thing. And, and, but that's not what we see in the Bible. Now, to be clear, repentance is like not repentance without the personal thing. But the call here is for Nineveh to repent corporately. This is a group activity. Without it, maybe it's not real either king calls for a fast he calls everyone to turn away from their violence and i love verse nine man it says who knows god may yet turn and relent my working theory here is that the king of nineveh seems to understand that his response of repentance does not automatically remove the punishment that's been promised to them repentance is required and he's going to make sure that they do it but it's not some cosmic get out of jail free card it's not a, a works-based effort to manipulate god's blessing and curse no repentance is a core level correction of how we see ourselves before an infinitely holy god there's a core level correction that flows naturally into every corner of who we are so the king of nineveh he humbles himself before the true king he puts on, he puts his hope, not, not, in, not in his physical acts of repentance, not in his efforts to try to appease this God that he doesn't know much about yet, but rather in the character of the one who may yet still relent. That's true repentance. That's, that's what God does when he changes a heart. This isn't some action for him. The heart has been changed and the actions flow out of that. heart that's been truly changed by God will see God correctly and then see themselves correctly in light of that correct view of God. Forget about all the other correct pieces of theology that Jonah happens to be running around with. There's lots of good things rolling around in Jonah's head about who God is. What he doesn't know yet is the main point. He doesn't understand how he relates to this God. He's still holding on to the false idea that his position before God is somehow owed to him. 
that it belongs to him by birthright as a Jew or, as, or by vocation as a prophet of the Lord. But like, like we've been seeing all along, Jonah is the recipient of an abounding compassion long before God's call to take that message of compassion to any undeserving other. Now I'm confident, completely convinced that God will eventually get Jonah there. It's just not today. There's more work to be done on Jonah. There's more, there's more for him to be humbled in. But for now, for now, the people of God, the people that God sent Jonah to preach to, the Ninevites, they seem to get it. They seem to get it, which is, which is why we see this in verse 10. Now God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil way. God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So whether Jonah did actually preach the condition of relenting, or he failed to, and the people of Nineveh just kind of figured it out by implication, whatever it was, the condition was real. Repent or face my wrath. And if they repent, God will stay his hand. And Nineveh, man, they truly repented. I truly repented. And so the God who keeps every single promise he's ever made kept that one too. So what do we do with all this? I mean, is it just a story from like 2,800 years ago? Like, what, what do we do with this? How can we respond to God's word this morning? Well, if you're here and you're, you're not a follower of Jesus yet, the answer is that you respond by meeting Jesus. Listen, the threat of destruction coupled with the promise of undeserved grace through repentance, that's not isolated to a story in Jonah. That's not a one-time thing that played out in, in the history of God's people. That's the deal on the table for every sinner that's ever lived. The Bible teaches that we are all, by default, separated from God relationally because of our sin. That we are owed the just and right punishment for that sin, right? Death. But the Bible also teaches. The Bible also teaches that it is while we are still sinners that Christ died for us. The eternal Son of God put on flesh and dwelt among us. He lived a sinless life that neither you nor I am capable of living. And he rose again from the, uh, he died on the cross as a payment for our sin. And he rose again from the dead as a vindication of his perfect and sufficient righteousness. And so, as the one who conquered both sin and death, the king who stands victorious over it all, he now calls on you to respond to him in repentance and faith. You can do that this morning. And I'd love to be helpful to you. I, um, in a moment, I'm going to pray and we're going to sing. And that's, a, that's a time that we set aside for, to help people put action to what God's stirring in their hearts, a way of responding in some kind of physical way. And so if you want somebody to talk to, I'll be standing down front here. But what if you're here and you're already a follower of Jesus, what, how, do, how do we respond? Well, we lean into what God is revealing about himself in the text, right? And this week, this week, I think he's showing us that he is the one who accomplishes his purposes when he invites us along in his work. It's his job. He's, he's perfectly capable of using half-hearted preachers. In fact, he's pretty good at it, it seems. He has never been dependent upon us to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Now, to be clear, obedience is required of us. That's what he expects of us when he invites us along. We must be faithful. But he has never been handcuffed to my lack of competency or charisma. It doesn't slow him down. So why does he invite us along then? Well, I can think of a couple of different reasons. For one, for one, because he gets the glory for accomplishing his will despite his broken tools. I'm kind of impressed when a, when a carpenter makes something pretty. I'm really impressed if he used my tools instead of his to do it. I know what my tools are like. I know how I take care of them. They're not so great. A lot of people shy away from sharing the gospel because they see themselves as somehow insufficient for the task. And to be clear, you are insufficient. And that's the point. God will be glorified through your insufficiency. God has never commanded competency or charisma from you. He's commanded faithfulness, and that's a different thing. 
And the glory of God will be magnified when he uses your insufficiency for his good purposes. But I think there's also a second reason why God invites us along in his mission. It's not just for his glory, it's also for our own personal joy. Our own personal joy. Jonah would have a much better time if he would just figure out his calling and it's not a burden on him. It's not some kind of burden that he needs to escape from, but rather an opportunity to play a role in the greatest story ever. Look what God is doing. Look what God is doing. The fish gets all the attention in the book of Jonah, and I think that's an absolute tragedy. It's an absolute tragedy. The most amazing thing about the story of Jonah is that God shows an astonishing grace and an abounding compassion to people that don't belong to him. A pagan people who are far from the Lord and deserve every bit of the wrath that is owed. And yet, God wants them to know him. He wants to call them to himself. And Jonah gets a front row seat for it all. What are you running away from, dude? Just think of what you'll witness if you walked faithfully in what God has called you to be a part of. Seven to eight hundred years before Jesus stepped on the scene, God called a town full of pagan Gentiles to himself. And if Jonah could just get out of Jonah's own way, he might just enjoy the spectacle of it all. In the same way, guys, our obedience to God's call in our own lives, it produces the same kind of joy. It's almost like he's smart enough to, to plan it out that way, right? So instead of running from it, we instead walk in obedience and we just might get to witness our own God-glorifying spectacle. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to respond in some, some other kind of way. Maybe it's being finally obedient to Jesus' call to be baptized. Or maybe you're here and you're, you feel like God's calling you to formally uh, join our church family and through membership. Or, or maybe it's time to publicly say yes to God's call to take his gospel to a faraway place like Nineveh. Whatever God's calling you to, now's a good time to do something with it. And so whoever you are and however God's calling you, let's respond together as a church family right now. Father, you're good to us. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for Jonah chapter 3. Thank you for being a God who grants true repentance. Repentance to those who have no business knowing you. Who would be perfectly just in always remaining separated from you and getting what we deserved. But you are good, and you love the unlovely, and you make yourself known to those who have no business getting to know you. And you provide for every need to reconcile us to you. So God, for those of us who who already know you, would you help us lean into faithfulness? Not as some kind of burden, but as the treat of getting to go to work with Daddy. As the treat of getting to witness all the other good things you're doing. Father, for those here who don't, know you yet would you make yourself known this morning i don't know if it requires sackcloth and ashes or fasts among the the peoples but we know that you're the god who grants repentance even through feeble preachers so god would you save people today call them to yourself open eyes to see and ears to hear change hearts to know you and I'm sure that things will flesh themselves out naturally after that. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.